Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Two thousand one, North Vancouver, on Canada's west coast. Do you know how to feel for a pulse? Try to see if you can feel for a pulse. Do you know how it? We've got the ambulance on the way. I've got several police cars on. Okay. A man is shot at point blank range. I can see a river of blood coming from him down the pathway. The victim is Wally Dekanich, a forty-one-year-old father of two murdered in cold blood. Seven years earlier, the parking lot of a downtown Vancouver apartment building, 43-year-old heroin dealer Joseph Gaja is dead. Shot in the back of the head by someone he knew. Two gruesome shootings, years apart. The circumstances and victims very different. Together, they'll lead a rookie cold case cop on a high stakes journey into a deadly criminal underworld. He was cold and not ruthless. Ripping open one of the biggest murder cases in Canadian history. I'm the one that had to take responsibility for this, whether it went good or it went bad. A quiet residential neighborhood on Vancouver's North Shore, home to 41-year-old father of two, Wally Dekanich. Like many North Vancouver residents, Wally was raised here, and he will die here a lot sooner than anyone expects. Tom Cattermole was Wally's best friend. I had met Wally originally back in, I'm guessing, about 72 or 73. We played some minor hockey together. But it wasn't until Tom transferred to Wally's high school that he found out what Wally was really made of. He kind of took me around the next few days and introduced me to everybody he could think of in the school. And uh, from there, we just became really close, really good friends. And Wally Dekanich was an easy guy to like. If there was a GQ magazine for juniors, Wally would have been on the cover. He was athletic, he was handsome, he had a pretty good sense of humor. He was just the kind of guy that always wanted to be part of that inner circle with him. And I was lucky for a few years, uh, the inner circle was me and Wally. So, you know, it, uh, it was a, just a terrific time and a terrific guy. After high school, Wally worked as a fisherman. Then with a young family to support, he turned his talents to the more lucrative stock market. Wally got involved in the stock promotions uh, in a smaller level in the mid to late 1990s. And by uh, 2000, 2001, he was uh, promoting uh, a couple of different uh, Vancouver companies. And not all were wise investments. A lot of stocks in Vancouver, including those that uh, Wally uh, was promoting, were highly speculative. Most of them end up in oblivion. Taking a lot of people's money with them including Wally's. It is known that he had run up substantial personal debts, uh, including a quarter million dollar debt to a, uh, to a Canadian bank. Bottom line, Wally's broke. Then one of his big investments goes belly up and he and a friend lose a lot of money. Now Wally's desperate. That's when he discovers something that he hopes will help them both recoup some of their losses. He'd inadvertently come across some information. There was some money missing that wasn't being reported. When he found this out, he tried to uh, get money out of the people that were responsible. And so he, he was saying, you should pay us some money back or I'll report this. But Wally's associates don't like being threatened. 
And now they've sent trouble to his front door. When these people approached Wally at his house, there was a brief meeting where they wanted him to stop what he was doing. And he said he wasn't going to. So they've decided to shut him up for good. A neighbor discovers Wally and calls 911. Do you know how to feel for a pulse? Try to see if you can feel for a pulse. Do you know how? And... Okay, feel, feel carefully for like 10 seconds. See if you can feel for a pulse. I do not know. I do not know. We've got the ambulance on the way. I've got several police cars on the way. Okay. The killer makes his getaway. You heard footsteps running away. Yeah, but you don't know what direction. You did not hear a car taking off. Is that correct? That's right, I didn't. 41-year-old Wally Dekanich is dead. The father of two was shot at point-blank range on the doorstep of his North Vancouver townhouse. Police don't know it yet, but the man who killed him will be the focus of another investigation, a seven-year-old unsolved homicide reopened by rookie cold case cop Lee Bergerman. Getting onto the unsolved homicide unit was a huge goal for me. Now, after 14 years as a police officer and undercover agent, Bergerman has just been promoted to this elite squad. The man who hired her is Doug Henderson. With Lee, uh, I was quite impressed with her past record. I'd done sort of my due diligence on, on her, and uh, I looked uh, like she would be a good prospect for the unsolved homicide unit. I was excited about it, but I was apprehensive because you're working with all these really experienced and significant homicide investigators and you're kind of the new kid on the block. So it was, it was nerve wracking. Even though it was the year 2000, she was still a woman a police officer coming into a very male dominated area. So she certainly was gonna be under the scrutiny and the microscope of people. And Bergerman's first cold case is a doozy. The unsettling and unsolved murder of Vancouver drug dealer Joseph Gaja. Started reading and just really wrapping my head around about what happened seven years ago. A residential street in Vancouver's West End. A passerby makes a grisly discovery. Original investigating officer Dave Aiken was one of the first on the scene. A long weekend of uh, 93, uh, my partner Steve Pranzel and I were called out. We found a small car parked nose in. It turned out to be a stolen car, and there was a uh, white male in the passenger, front passenger seat, slumped over. Belted in, obviously dead. When we searched through the car, we found uh, lots of interesting things. There was a couple of shell casings in the back, uh, obviously a small caliber handgun. It's a caliber of bullet that typically doesn't exit the body. And especially with a headshot, uh, will bounce around in the skull cavity and causing damage and is going to be fatal. And there was a small amount of blood on the outside of the driver's door. But no one to whom they could match it, and little chance that was going to change. We seemed to have no witnesses who were going to talk to us. Joe Gage's side of this um, scenario, his, his girlfriend and all of his associates, none of them were willing to give us anything that we could conceivably take to court. You've done everything you think you can. You've gathered the physical evidence. You've analyzed that. You have to look at what are your chances of success by carrying on. And the new ones keep coming. Aiken and Prenzel moved on to other cases, and the Joseph Gaja murder got shelved in the cold case unit of British Columbia's RCMP. Now, seven years later, it's Lee Bergerman's job to drag it out of hibernation by reading the timeline and the daily log and witness statements, and I went over and over and over it again. 
It was just one of a rash of Vancouver murders, all with the same M.O. The quick hit, the stolen car, the lack of fingerprints, and not a single witness. I thought it was a professional, like a contract killing. They do surveillance on their target. They hire a driver. They have the car stolen. So it's, it's, it's an organized process for them. It's only when Lee Bergerman turns her attention to the crime scene photos that she begins to think it may not have been the work of pros after all. A package of cigarettes on the floor, a lighter. He was shot sitting slumped over in the passenger seat. So to me, and it looked like he was just about to light a cigarette because it was all on the floor. Whoever he got into the car with, he was somewhat comfortable. He knew them or was business associates with them. Bergerman pours through the evidence yet again. In addition to the victim's blood in the car, remember that small amount of blood on the outside of the driver's door? It belonged to someone else and contains DNA that might well lead police to the killer, but only if they have a suspect to whom they can compare it. Now, Lee Bergerman may have found one. Buried in the witness statements, the passing mention of a man who may have had reason to rub out Joseph Gaja, Mickey Smith. Word had it, Gaja knew Smith, and knew Smith's wife even better. One of the witnesses uh, had explained to us that Mickey Smith was upset at Joe Gaja because of something that um, Joe Gaja had done or said about Mickey Smith's wife. Though Lee Bergerman doesn't know it yet, she's on the cusp of cracking open one of the biggest and most shocking murder cases in Canadian history. What she does know is that her first cold case as lead investigator is turning out to be a brain teaser. Seven years earlier, drug dealer Joseph Gaja was shot in the back of the head, his body left in a stolen car in a downtown Vancouver garage. Though it looked like a contract killing, Bergerman believes Gaja knew his killer. Whoever he got into the car with, he was somewhat comfortable. And suspect Mickey Smith fits that bill. Not only did Smith know Joseph Gaja, he may even have had a reason to kill him, since Gaja was rumored to have had an affair with Mickey's wife. Bergerman hopes DNA results from blood at the scene of the crime will link Mickey to the murder. In the meantime, she wants to talk to Smith, but first she has to find him. We started checking every single previous address that we knew for him to see if we could find him. Once that came up short, we started looking for his ex-wife, places where she had lived over the years. We set up surveillance on a residence that we knew Mickey Smith's ex-wife lived there, hoping that eventually that would see Mickey Smith either coming or going from the residence. It's a long shot lead in a case going nowhere fast, but it's Bergerman's only option. The first to keep watch, Vancouver police officer Alan Catley, armed with an up-to-date picture of Mickey Smith. And it was a static surveillance where, you know, you just turn up, sit there for 20 minutes. If there's action, there's act if there's not, there's not. Was parked in an unmarked unit at Lakewood and Hastings. And as I was looking out the front of the windshield, he walked past. They had found their prime suspect within the first 20 minutes of their first day of surveillance. When I told Lee, it was ecstatic. Nobody can pin him to an address. It was luck. And it may well be a major turning point in Bergerman's investigation, since Smith is their only suspect in the Joseph Gaja murder. I was so excited because I have been looking for this guy in every conceivable way and getting discouraged and then right away it's making plans to set up extensive surveillance so that we can learn what kind of guy he is what he does with his life 
Police observe Smith as he hops on a bus and makes his way to Vancouver's North Shore. Little wonder it took so long to locate him. Mickey Smith had found the perfect hideout. The last place I would have looked for him was in a trailer park under the Lionsgate Bridge. For the next few weeks, police don't take their eyes off Mickey Smith. He sleeps little and drinks a lot, hopping from one bar to another. That was the style of life he enjoyed. Um, he was um, dysfunctional in lots of ways. Just kind of going from day to day, picking up money wherever he could. It is hardly the profile of a murderer. Perhaps Mickey Smith is nothing more than advertised, an unassuming former insurance salesman with the unfortunate nickname Bozo the Clown. Bergerman needs to loosen his lips. The goal is to make him feel comfortable so he will talk about his, his crimes, specifically the uh, murder of Joe Gaja. Her plan, to have an undercover operator befriend Smith and draw out his secrets. And she happens to know just the guy, undercover agent Rod Lazenby. Once you leave home in the morning to come to work, you are a criminal. Think like a criminal, be a criminal, dress like a criminal, talk like a criminal. Lazenby will play the part of a mob boss from a fictional Toronto crime family. Dressed in an organized crime uniform, which would be a leather jacket, uh, sports type like, high collar shirt, nice pants, nice shoes, hairs combed back with uh, real cream. Bergerman has Lazenby spend time at Mickey's favorite haunts, chatting up the locals, becoming a familiar face. Now, everything hinges on their first meeting. We call it a cold approach. It's the most difficult part of an undercover operation at the very, at the very beginning of the operation for you to be introduced by yourself to the target. If Smith smells a setup, it'll derail Bergerman's investigation and put her cold case career on ice. It's a nerve wracking and it's a, it's a risky process because you've done all this work and um, if you get shut down or there's no engagement, it's, it's difficult to go back. So I walk up to him and say, hey listen, do you know where this place is? He says, yeah, I know where it is. I say, well, can you take me there? I'll give you some money. I'll give you 50 bucks to take me to this place. He said, no, I'm not going to get involved. Their worst fear seems to be coming true. Mickey isn't taking the bait. That's when his buddy stepped in and said, listen, take it. It's 50 bucks. This guy's a good guy. I said, OK, I'll go. He gets up. We go out to the, to the Cadillac. And as soon as he saw that, uh, he was intrigued. Lee Bergerman is in the midst of a cold case that's about to get very hot. She has finally found Mickey Smith, the only suspect in the seven-year-old unsolved murder of drug dealer Joseph Gaja. Police had spotted Smith outside the apartment building of his ex-wife, the same woman with whom Joe Gaja was rumored to have had an affair. Investigators tail Mickey Smith, get to know his habits, then assign undercover cop Rod Lazenby to befriend Smith. Lazenby is playing the part of an Ontario crime boss, and Smith, who wants back in the game, is eager to impress. He was starting to talk about his criminal past before we even got to the other bar. He mentions to our undercover operator that he was in a book called The Canadian Connection. It was his connection to Fats Robertson, who was a significant criminal figure in Vancouver. That was to impress me, because I should know who Fats Robertson is if I'm an organized crime from Toronto. Lazenby passes the test and will spend the next few weeks building a bond with Mickey Smith. The bar is also the perfect place to get a DNA sample from Smith. One police hope will match the blood found on the car door at Joseph Gaja's murder scene. He was a, a drinker of beer and he was a smoker of cigarettes. He'd smoked a lot of cigarettes. Whether he was in a bar or in the car, whenever he left that area when I was by myself, I could take one or two or three of those cigarette butts and put them in an envelope, stick them in my pocket. 
While they wait for the DNA results, Bergerman has Lazenby offer Smith some supposed mob work, including smurfing, depositing crime money in amounts of less than $10,000 to avoid unwelcome questions from the authorities. I'd be driving the Cadillac, he'd be sitting beside me, I would give them big wads of money and say, go into that world bank, go into that bank, go into that bank, and deposit. Here's a deposit slip for you. That's going to one of our accounts. That's going to one of our companies. So that's what he did, and he thought he was laundering money. And they hope they're gaining Smith's trust. And that was the thing with Mickey. He never told any lies. He never fabricated anything. And the only thing I never really got out of him at any time was he always talked about his boots. And I said to him, yeah, wear some shoes, man. Get rid of the boots. No, I've done a lot of things in these boots, and these boots have got a history with me. I'm keeping with the boots. But Smith did seem prepared to clean up his act in other ways. His self-esteem had gone up. You could tell a big difference in him and the way he dressed and the way he carried himself. Cleaned himself up. Hands were clean, nails were clean, hair was combed. He even got a few haircuts while we were with him. So his demeanor was better because he was somebody. We could tell that he was, he was believing what we were doing and it was very exciting. Lee Bergerman went go to a store or to a lit warehouse and she would buy big boxes full of cigarettes and a bunch of cases of booze and that's what we put in the back of a Brennan truck and that's what we moved around. So it was all legally purchased and legally taken back. But we would just put it across as being stolen property, props for the scenario. Their ultimate goal is to get Mickey to feel comfortable enough to talk about the killing of Joseph Geisha. But to do that, undercover operatives can't afford to relax, not even for a moment. We couldn't make a mistake and all of a sudden start t talking to him like policeman or that kind of authority. He would pick up on that. Any kind of activity that would look like a straight shooter, straight John as they say on the street, he would pick up on that. If we're criminals, we better be a criminal organization because he knows what a criminal organization is. He lived it. So that's what we had to portray. They even went as far as to stage a murder of their own. An execution of a woman who supposedly ratted the crime family out. The way it was gonna work, I was sitting in the back seat of the Mercedes and I had the gun and I was gonna go do this scenario. And he was in the front seat saying, no, no boss, I should be doing that. That's below you to do, I should be doing that. And I said to him, no, I brought her into the organization I take her out. Lazenby has Mickey stand guard while he heads into an abandoned building. Uh, he was a pretty cool cucumber. While we were supposedly in whacking this girl, he was picking the fluff off his jacket. Then he'd get out in the car and I was checking my face, see if there was any blood supposedly in my face. He said, no boss, you're okay. But Mickey still doesn't admit to the seven-year-old killing of Joseph Gaja. And to make matters worse, the comparison of Smith's DNA to that found at the crime scene is a bust. The blood doesn't match. I mean, we'll figure out, you know, it has to be explained, but sometimes it just can't be. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a disappointment. Perhaps Bergerman has had it wrong about Mickey all along. Lead investigator Lee Bergerman and her team have been working Mickey Smith, trying to tie him to the 1993 murder of drug dealer Joseph Gaja. But after months of bonding with Smith and paying him for fake mob work, undercover cop Rod Lazenby has been unable to squeeze a confession from their only suspect. Even a staged murder of a supposed crime family snitch didn't loosen Mickey Smith's lips. Worse still, DNA found at the scene of Joe Gaja's death seven years earlier doesn't match Mickey's, which raises the question, are police chasing the wrong guy? And now, just when they can least afford to let up on their investigation, Lee Bergerman learns that Rod Lazenby has to go out of town to testify in a whole other case. We had to make arrangements for, you know, days off where there wasn't gonna be any interaction with the undercover operator and 
and the target, Mickey. Which brings us back to the beginning of our story and Vancouver's tranquil North Shore. Father of two, Wally Dekanich is settling in for an evening at home, alone. The small-time stock promoter is under a lot of pressure. He thinks he's uncovered a fraud, missing money that's found its way into the pockets of his business associates. Now Dekanich is threatening to expose them unless they cough up some cash. It is a calculation that will cost him dearly. Across town, a killer sets out by car for North Vancouver. His destination, Wally Dekanich's home. His mission, to shut the stock promoter up forever. It is late afternoon when he arrives at the entrance to the townhouse complex. He cruises by repeatedly, waiting for it to get dark. Just after 6 p.m., the assassin pulls on a pair of woolen gloves and walks to Dekanich's door. In his hand, a 22 caliber pistol equipped with a silencer. The killer makes his getaway. A neighbor discovers Wally and calls 911. You heard footsteps running away. Yeah, but you don't know what direction. You did not hear a car taking off. Is that correct? That's right, I didn't. Do you know how to feel for a pulse? I have to see if you can feel for a pulse. Do you know how? And... Okay, feel, feel carefully for like 10 seconds. See if you can feel for a pulse. I do not know. I do not know. We've got the ambulance on the way. I've got several police cars on. Okay. The attending cop is an RCMP trainee who's been on the job just a month. As we pulled up to the unit, I could see a male lying in the doorway. It seemed to be half in the door, half out. I could also see um, what I described as a river of blood coming from him down the pathway. He wasn't moving. There was a lot of blood, but it was coming out from underneath him. So I was sort of kneeling down beside him and um, had him turn over onto my lap. I couldn't tell if he was breathing. I don't think he was breathing at the time, but uh, I could feel a faint pulse. And so I began to talk to him and say, you know, help is coming, try and hang in there. But shot four times in the chest and head, Wally Dekanich doesn't stand a chance. I clearly remember that uh, when I was holding him that his heart did stop beating because I couldn't feel a heartbeat anymore. It was uh, very upsetting for everybody that lived there. It was uh, very unusual. It's a beautiful place to live. It's a safe neighborhood. Someone deliberately planned and deliberately killed Wally. Just, you're Wally, yes, anyone home, no, boom, kills him. They were serious criminals. Stock promoter and father of two, Wally Dekanich, is dead. Killed in cold blood on the doorstep of his North Shore townhouse. While North Vancouver police search for Dekanich's killer, RCMP cold case investigators resume their sting operation into the 1993 murder of drug dealer Joseph Gaja. And Rod Lazenby, back in his role as a mob boss, meets up again with suspect Mickey Smith. I pick him up, we get in the car, we're driving away, and he says, I took care of business while you are away, boss. And I said, what do you mean you took care of business? Well, I took care of business. And he goes like this in the car. I said, you shoot somebody? He said, yeah. I'm a little taken aback when we're talking about this. Really? <laughs> Mickey Smith has proof. So he showed me his thumb. Well, through his thumbnail was a hole. Lazenby has heard about the Dekanich murder, 
Now Mickey is bragging about having committed it and giving Lazenby a play-by-play -play of the killing. First, he pumped a shot into Wally's chest, but Mickey tells Lazenby his victim fought back. He come at me, I grabbed a hold of him, they shoot him again, and I said, I was so excited I shot myself through my thumb. Pissed me off so bad when, he, when I shot myself my thumb, I shot him twice more and he was on the floor. They are details only the killer would know, and Lazenby is gobsmacked. They wanted Mickey to admit to a previous murder, not commit a fresh one. Lazenby breaks away at the first opportunity and gets word out to the RCMP. That's huge. That's massive to get information like that coming in. That, that was right, right spot on. I knew that without a shadow of doubt in my mind, that was the guy. I felt bad. I felt terrible. What signs were there that we should have known this? Did he ever say anything, you know, that would give us an idea, but he never said a word. We had no idea that he was up to anything of any sort. There was nothing. Mickey Smith has become a serious liability. Maybe he's got more contracts. Maybe he won't ask us and more people are gonna die. So we had to bring it to an end. Lee Bergerman would have, would have been under some, some pressure there at that point. The pace of this investigation um, became very, very quick. Unable to arrest Mickey based on a casual confession, Bergerman arranges for him to travel to Toronto, where he'll meet what he thinks is the head of the crime family. But it is in fact an elaborate Mr. Big sting operation. What we want to do is set him up in a, an environment where he's talking to our undercover operator's boss. And we want details of the murder in North Van and the Joe Gage murder. On a chilly winter afternoon, Rod Lazenby takes Mickey to the outskirts of Toronto and an empty warehouse. For the sting to be a success, Smith must not only provide more detail on the recent murder of family man Wally Dekinich, but he must also confess to the 1993 Gaja killing. Bergerman and her partner watch from above. It was like an addict watching this from kind of a bird's eye view, and we can't make a peep, we can't move, we can't sneeze, nothing. And we were right above it, watching this all unfold. I introduced him to them, uh, shake hands with the boss, he shakes hands with the boss. And we had it all wired up so that we could intercept the conversation. Mr. Big tells Mickey he's got big plans for him. Maybe I got a job for you. Can you do this? This is how much we're going to pay you. Yeah, I can do that for you. He was told by the undercover operators that this contract killing may involve women and there might be a couple of kids around. He said that he had no problems with that. So that's pretty cold. But the crime boss, who's really a police officer, tells Mickey that in order to bring him into the organization, he needs Mickey to provide details on all his crimes. If he had anything to do with the Gaja homicide, this was going to be the time that he's going to talk about it. Smith delivers. He tells Mr. Big that he killed cold case victim Joseph Gaja because he was rumored to be cooperating with police. He reveals that he drove the car because his accomplice couldn't drive a standard, and then Smith inadvertently called the fatal shot. He said, geez, um, you better watch out. Those cigarettes are going to kill you. And this was right before he was going to light a cigarette, and the, the who was supposed to be the driver, is now in the back seat, thought that was the sign to shoot him, so he did. And though it was the driver that pulled the trigger, Mickey makes it clear that he was the main man behind the killing and the cleanup. And he says we wiped off the steering wheel and the handles and we took off. And that was the Joe Gaja homicide. Then Mickey Smith admits to the murder of Wally Dekinich. Smith had heard through his criminal contacts about a stock promoter with a mouth that was too big and a contract to kill him that paid too little. He said, 
$10,000 just isn't enough anymore. And um, I just told I just told them I need thirty thousand dollars because you got to hire a driver, you got to do this, you got. So it was, you know, he was talking about it like it was a contract for painting an apartment. Mickey's callous confessions are everything police had hoped for. We had him for, you know, the Gaja homicide, and now we've got him for this fresh one. Suspect Mickey Smith has been fooled by an undercover operation confessing not only to the seven-year-old murder of drug dealer Joseph Gaja, but also the recent killing of Vancouver stock promoter Wally Dekinich. Watching the sting from the attic of the Toronto warehouse is cold case lead investigator Lee Bergerman. It was incredible. It was pretty exciting. But Mickey has more to say, and the undercover operatives who are posing as big-time criminals can hardly believe their ears. The man they've been shadowing for months is no common criminal, but a ruthless and pathological killer, a guy who murders without hesitation or remorse. Mickey Smith is a hitman. He was 19 when he committed his first killing. The year was 1969, and he'd been hired by a criminal bigwig. The target was 58-year-old mobster Lucien Mayer. Mickey attacked him in a restaurant parking lot, beat him, and slashed his throat. Five months later, he killed Jack Tadich in a Burnaby hotel room. Tadich was rumored to be a stool pigeon. Mickey stabbed him more than 40 times. Then in 1999, Paul Solik, who is alleged to be ripping off a biker gang, goes missing. Mickey boasts about how he made him disappear. He shot him, and then he dismembered him, cut him up, and he gave gra graphic details about how he dismembered this guy. Five brutal executions over a span of 32 years. Who'd ever thought when, when we opened up the Gaja homicide seven years after that we would end up, you know, five months later, a guy confessing to five. If what Smith is saying is true, these murders will set in motion one of the biggest criminal prosecutions in Canadian history. But for the moment, his words are practically worthless. The confession alone from Mickey Smith about all these murders that he talked about mean nothing unless you can corroborate it. Because a confession in an undercover scenario, the judges will tell a jury that they're inherently unreliable because of this whole bragging and bravado thing that these guys will do. To convict Smith, police will need the murder weapon he used to kill Wally Dekinich. Mr. Big instructs him to return to Vancouver to get it. Mickey knew he was flying back to go and retrieve the gun that he used in the Dekinich homicide and give them to our undercover operator so that we could dispose of them properly. After landing at the Vancouver airport, Lazenby and Smith head out by car. Unbeknownst to Mickey, they're being trailed by an arrest team. After five nerve-wracking months, the success of the entire operation hangs on what happens next. It's nightfall when the two reach their destination. They drove out to exactly where Mickey said he had the gun hidden. It was in a yard wrecking area of Langley. He went out of the car. And he walked in. He dug it up. They were wrapped in a big towel that was full of blood. Brought the gun to the car and gave it to me to get rid of. So there was the gun and the silencer. The weapon that killed Wally, the most important piece of evidence, handed over to the police by the killer himself. Well, then we went from there. We're just having some conversation. Hey, let's go have a few drinks. Celebrate. You're with the family now. Let's go have a few drinks, I'll buy. 
but this would be Mickey Smith's last taste of freedom. It's always like a big takedown. Just like you'd see in the movies. The guns and all that stuff. Hit the ground, hit the ground. And it looked like they arrested all of us. And away we went. I go my way and Mickey goes his way. Mickey was very surprised when he got arrested. He actually thought he was embarking on this incredible new criminal life. The guns he turned over tested positive as the murder weapon, and the um, towel wrapped around the guns had was full of his blood, which is consistent with the story about shooting himself when he did the, the hit. It will be enough to convict Smith of one count of murder, but Bergerman's biggest satisfaction is still to come. The first time I ever saw Mickey after he was arrested was when I went and saw him when he was in uh, remand in Vancouver, and we got to advise him of the other four murder charges that were being laid against him. But it would be two and a half years before the investigation team would come face to face with their suspect in one of the biggest criminal cases the Canadian courts have ever seen. The first time I got in the witness box, there was, there was eye contact and, you know, he's just smug and ornery is how I would describe him. When I get up and say, I'm, my name is Rodney Francis Lazy, a regular member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, he knows. And we looked at each other, and he smiled, and I smiled, and that was it. We never had any conversation at all. Nor is he likely to, ever. On October 10, 2003, Mickey Smith is found guilty of five counts of murder. He is sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. It consumed three years of my life, that investigation. So. It's pretty rewarding to have a guy like that in jail and never getting out. Mickey Smith's killing spree is over, and lead investigator Lee Bergerman has finally solved one of the biggest murder cases in Canadian history. Not bad for a rookie cold case cop. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever think when you got this box that had Gadja and the file number on it, that three years later, you'd have a contract killer who's been doing it for 32 years in jail for five murders. Never. Lee Bergerman was promoted to sergeant in October 2003 and became an inspector in June 2007. As for Mickey Smith, he won't become eligible for parole until the age of 78. For more information, go to myviva.ca forward slash murder she solved. <laughs>